This is Positively Farming Media. Hello, my gardening friends, and welcome back to the Just Grow Something podcast. One of the best flavors of summer has to be sweet corn right from the stalk. I eat it raw. Seriously. Or I might heat it up just enough to melt some butter on it. But really, if it's picked at the right time and eaten right away, you really don't need anything on it. It's just that good. If you're lucky to find some at the farmer's market and can get it home and eat it right away, it's almost as good. But we can absolutely grow our own, even in small-ish spaces. And what about growing our own dried corn varieties? There are so many choices when it comes to dent corn, popcorn, and other dried corn types that we can use for cornmeal or even just for decoration. You've probably seen beautiful glass-colored heirloom varieties in catalogs that are almost too pretty to be believed. But what you also may have seen in those seed catalogs next to the sweet corn are little letters like SU and SH2, or terms like synergistic or sugar-enhanced. What does all that mean, and is it genetically modified? Today, we're going to figure out exactly what it takes to grow both sweet corn and dried corn, all the differences between the two categories and the corn varieties within them, what can plague corn plants while we're trying to grow them, and how to harvest and store it. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm Karen, and I started gardening 18 years ago in a small corner of my suburban backyard. When we moved to a five-acre homestead, I expanded that garden to half an acre, and I found such joy and purpose in feeding my family and friends. This newfound love for digging in the dirt and providing for others prompted my husband and I to grow our small homestead into a 40-acre market farm. When I went back to school to get my degree in horticulture, I discovered there is so much power in food, and I want to share everything I've learned with as many people as possible. On this podcast, we explore crop information, soil health, pests and diseases, plant nutrition, our own nutrition, and so much more in the world of food and gardening. So grab your garden journal and a cup of coffee and get ready to just grow something. So before we jump into corn, I got to tell you, I made a little bit of a discovery the other day, and I had to share it with you. I have a book club going on right now for the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network, and I started an Audible trial in order to be able to, you know, quote unquote, read the book, because I honestly don't have any time or energy to be reading at the moment, because I'm spending most of my time in the fields. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just listen to the book. And as I was looking through the trial and looking through Audible, I saw that there are podcasts. So, of course, I was like, oh, well, let's see what mine looks like. So I went and searched for mine, and I found a review. Like, I had no idea you could leave ratings and reviews on podcasts over in Audible. And this one was from way back in January, so you know I needed to share it with you. This was a five-star rating and review from Jason Lattimore titled Simply Amazing. So glad that I found this podcast. I've been trying to get my homesteading project off the ground for years and have been struggling with pest slash disease pressure in my garden. This podcast has been a godsend, not only in these areas, but in working out timing and other strategies. I'm almost caught up and look forward to more. Well, Jason, hopefully you are caught up and thank you so very much for that review. I hope your gardening and homesteading efforts are off to a fantastic start this spring, and I am so glad that I can help. So if you've left a review somewhere other than Apple Podcast, and I haven't read it here, please feel free to reach out and let me know. I love sharing the feedback and shouting you all out who've taken the extra step to leave that feedback because it really does mean a lot to me. I only get notifications if it's left on Apple for whatever reason. So send me a DM, a DM on social or an email from my website or something and let me know if I've missed you. Thank you, Jason, very much for that simply amazing review. So let's get into corn, specifically the difference between sweet corn, dent corn, popcorn, flower corn, all the different corns. So sweet corn is picked at an immature state. This is known as its milk stage. And because of this, sweet corn is sweet rather than being starchy because there's still a higher percentage of sugar. Now, of course, this sugar very quickly reverts to more starch than sugar after it's harvested, which is why eating sweet corn soon right after it's picked is really 
really necessary to get the best flavor and the texture. Um, sweet corn right off the stalk can be eaten raw. Literally, this is how I do it. Um, the longer it sits around, the more starchy it gets. It starts to sort of change its texture a little bit, and it's just not as good. Of course, there are varieties of corn that have been bred to be even sweeter in this milk stage, and they're divided into different categories that we'll go into here in a little bit. So how does sweet corn differentiate from dent corn, popcorn, and the other dried corns? So dent corn, also known as field corn, is the primary corn planted in the U.S. primarily used for animal feed. Around 93% of what's grown um, as of dent corn is used as animal feed. We also use it for cornmeal, cornstarch, and corn syrup, um, ethanol, and other commercial uses. It's referred to as dent corn because a dent forms in the top of the kernel as it begins to dry on the stalk. So this is the main difference between sweet corn and the other corns. Where sweet corn is harvested in the milk stage, the others are all left to mature and to dry out on the stalk. Now, popcorn is a variety of corn that has a hard, moisture-resistant hull that surrounds a dense pocket of starch that will pop when heated. The kernels are rice-shaped or pearl-shaped. Now, flint corn is often lumped into this popcorn category, even though traditionally there are some differences between the two. There are a lot of nuances here, but many of the very colorful varieties of heirloom dried corns, often referred to as Indian corn, are these popcorn and flint corn varieties. These are the traditional varieties used by Native Americans as a dietary staple. Now, flower corn is soft throughout that kernel. There isn't a hard endosperm like there is on other corn types. And when dried, the kernels will shrink uniformly with very little dent or no dent at all, and it remains fairly starchy. Now, because of this, it can be ground more finely when it's dried, and the texture is more like a soft flour than a coarse meal. Now, in most cases, whatever you buy in the store for your cornmeal, grits, hominy, polenta, masa, whatever, this has come from dent corn or field corn. If you order an heirloom popping or grinding variety, it is likely a true popcorn or flint corn. You'd also have to look very specifically for a flower variety. Southern Exposure Seed Exchange has a nice variety of dent, flint, and flower corn. And, of course, there are a wide, wide range of heirloom and modern hybrid varieties of good old sweet corn. So... Keep in mind, as I share growing information, um, that other than harvesting and storage, growing any corn is relatively the same. I will differentiate the harvesting specifics for the dried corn when we get to that segment, and we'll also discuss that again in the storage section. So, as always, let's start our corny discussion with the basics. So the scientific name for sweet corn is Zia maize variety saccharate. Now this makes sense because in chemistry, saccharate is a derivative of sugar. Now this is where plant nomenclature gets really interesting to me. So for all of the corns, it is all Zia maize, but the variety is different. So again, sweet corn is Zia maize variety saccharate. When we get to dent corn, the variety is Indenata, indented, right? So then popcorn is ZMA's variety Averta, which the Latin for Averto is disturb or to agitate. So you agitated the corn and it popped, right? And then with flint corn, it's variety Indurate, which means to harden. And then with flower corn, it's ZMA's variety Amylaceae, which means starch-like. So if you're looking for a particular type of corn, when you're looking in the different catalogs, and you're not sure whether it's a popcorn or it's intended to be a flower corn or it's a flint corn or whatever, you can look at the scientific name for it and you can see what the variety is and you will know exactly what it's intended to be used for. This is the beauty of plant nomenclature. Now, corn is in the plant family Poaceae. This is the grass family. 
Technically, though, corn is more than a grass. In its different forms, it can actually be considered three different things. So the plant is a grass, but the seed is a grain. And in our human diet, eaten as sweet corn, it's classified as a vegetable. Now, corn originated in the Americas and is now the third most widely distributed feed crop in the world, also being used as livestock feed, biofuel, and other industrial applications like paper, wallboard, filling materials. Corn was first domesticated from a wild grass by native peoples in southern Mexico about 10,000 years ago. Its culture had spread as far north as southern Maine by the time the Europeans settled North America. They learned how to grow it from the Native Americans, and its worldwide spread has continued from there. So, speaking of the Native Americans, it's probably a very good time to talk about the cultural significance and ethnobotanical uses of corn. Remember, ethnobotany is the study of a region's plants and their practical uses through the traditional knowledge of a local culture and its people. These uses are cited as a historical and anthropological resource. Say it with me, never ingest the parts of any plant without being absolutely positive of its effect upon the human body. <laughs> now, corn was likely the most important food crop to be cultivated in Northern America by indigenous tribes. The summer corn harvest was so important that many tribes held ceremonies to pray for a successful crop. Corn, also called maize, was so versatile it was eaten at almost every meal by the tribes that grew it. Large quantities were eaten fresh during the summer, either raw from the stock, hey, like I do, roasted in the coals of a fire or baked into soups and breads. Excess corn harvested was dried on the stock or picked and hung to dry in the sun. And then the dried corn was ground into cornmeal and added to soups or baked. Now, unlike many of the crops that we've talked about, corn was not a plant really used medicinally, but it did have an effect on the health of the communities that did grow it. Tribes and communities that cultivated corn had a greater food yield over what could be achieved by hunting and gathering alone. So as a result, communities that grew corn and practiced other agriculture had a, law, a lower infant mortality and lower levels of malnutrition than non-farming groups. Now, corn protein lacks the essential amino acid lysine. Now, American Indians knowingly or unknowingly solved this problem by eating corn alongside beans, which are rich in lysine. And so this provided a more complete source of protein, which was especially important when hunting was scarce. Now, bean plants were also intermixed with the corn plants when they were growing. So this helped balance the soil's nitrogen levels. And there we get two of the three sisters in the planting method of the same name. Now, corn husks have also had a long history of use in tribal art and folk arts for objects like woven amulets, masks, corn husk dolls, sleeping mats and baskets, even shoes. The corn cobs were used to make darts to burn as fuel or made into ceremonial rattling sticks. And the colorful strains of dried corn are today often used in fall harvest decorations. Corn was and continues to be central in the arts, culture, and lifestyle of many indigenous tribes. Now, I mentioned that corn is lacking in lysine. So nutritionally speaking, what do we get from corn? For a 100-gram serving of boiled yellow corn, we get 96 calories, 3.4 grams of protein, 21 grams of carbs, 4.5 grams of sugar, 2.4 grams of fiber, and 1.5 and grams of fat. Now, the vitamin and mineral content of corn depends on the variety. Sweet corn is higher in vitamins like folate, B6, niacin, and potassium, where popcorn and other dried corns are higher in minerals like phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, and copper. Corn in general also contains higher amounts of certain antioxidants than many other cereal grains like lutein and phytic acid. And also, if you're growing the colorful types of dried corn, you get the anthocyanins as well. So let's talk about growing corn. Again, most of this will apply to all types of corn. Um, I will make some distinctions when we talk about harvesting and storage. Corn is a warm season crop that is sown from seed directly into the space where you want it to grow. I've seen people start individual corn plants inside and transplant them, but this is absolutely not necessary and you're more likely to damage the shallow root system when transplanting. So just sow them directly into the ground. 
Corn can germinate in a wide range of soil temperatures, from 55 Fahrenheit on up to 105 Fahrenheit, although the ideal range is between 65 and 85. Now, some of this is going to depend on the type of sweet corn you choose, though. There are a few cultivars that have been bred to germinate and do well in cooler soil, but unless you live in a very short season climate and are desperate to grow some sweet corn, I would stick to the warmer soil temperatures. Now, I guess now is a good time as any to differentiate between the types of sweet corn seed because if you shop from anything other than an heirloom seed catalog, you are going to see these abbreviations or descriptions and you're going to need to know what they mean. So standard sugar enhanced and super sweet are the three major types of sweet corn and there is now a fourth type called synergistic. They all differ in the level of sweetness, how well they keep, and their seed vigor, including those soil temperatures for germination. So standard sweet corn, which is abbreviated SU, those varieties possess the traditional sweet corn flavor and texture. Um, Unfortunately, ears of standard sweet corn varieties only retain their quality for about a day or two in the garden. You have a very narrow window in which to harvest these at that sweet milky stage, and this includes your heirloom varieties. Standard sweet corn varieties also don't store very well because the sugar really, really quickly converts to starch. So harvesting at just the right time and then consuming it very quickly is important for standard varieties. Your heirloom varieties and the oldest of our hybrid varieties are all standard sweet corns. The next one is sugar enhanced. This is abbreviated SE. The sugar levels of sugar-enhanced sweet corn are somewhere between those of the standard and the next one up, which is the super sweets. They have a softer kernel. It's more tender and easier to chew than the standard varieties. The harvest and storage periods are slightly longer than your standard sweet corn, but they also want a slightly warmer soil than standard. So soil temperatures around 60 Fahrenheit or 15 Celsius is the minimum temperature at which you want to plant your sugar enhanced varieties. Now, the next one is super sweet. This is abbreviated SH2 because it's also referred to as shrunken (laughs) 2 sweet corn. Um, Super sweet or shrunken 2 contains up to twice the amount of sugar as standard varieties. The name shrunken 2 actually comes because it gets a sort of shrunken or wrinkled appearance when the, the kernels are dry. That's really all it is. Um, The conversion of sugar to starch in these super sweet varieties happens at a much slower rate. So you've got a longer period of time um, in which you can go ahead and harvest these off of the plant. And they can also be stored for a longer period of time with not quite as much of a loss in quality or sweetness. They do have some drawbacks, though. First of all, the yields on super sweet varieties are generally lower than your standard sweet corn, and the seeds are also smaller, um, and they germinate poorly in cold soils. So, for instance, around here, like a standard sweet corn could be planted um, as, as early as late April, which is when the soil temperatures start to stay at or above 55 Fahrenheit or 13 Celsius. Um, the super sweet varieties need to wait until the soil temperature has is, has remained above 65 Fahrenheit or 18 Celsius. That isn't until around mid-May around here. And this is about the same time we're planting out our tomatoes and our peppers and our other heat-loving plants. So if you purchase a super sweet corn variety, which are very, very tasty, just don't plant until the soil is warmer. And then there's that fourth one, synergistic. This is the newest type of sweet corn, and it combines some of the characteristics of the super sweet and some of the characteristics of the sugar enhanced. And so they've got the higher levels of sugar than the sugar enhanced sweet corn, but their kernels are more tender than the super sweet. So they're really kind of a nice blend of both. 
Um, but they need to be planted a little bit later than the standard varieties um, because the seeds don't do well in, in cold soil. So a minimum of 60 Fahrenheit or 15 Celsius. And just so you know, most gardeners will not receive catalogs that have any genetically engineered or genetically modified sweet corn seeds for sale. When I started to see transgenic corn seed being offered in my catalog some years back, I got worried and I wondered if home gardeners could mistakenly purchase these for their own use. The answer is no. So even if you happen to end up with a commercial grower's catalog in your hands instead of one intended for a home gardener, and you happen to miss all the terms in that description about transgenics or modifications or genes or whatever, and even if you tried to order it, you'd be stopped by the seed company. Anyone ordering genetically engineered seeds of any kind needs to have a grower number registered and on file with whoever holds the seed patent and needs to sign patent protection agreements and all kinds of nonsense in order to get their hands on those seeds. So no worries about accidentally ordering a genetically modified seed. Now, corn as a crop needs full sun, and it likes a soil pH between 5.8 and 6.8. This is pretty close to any of our other vegetable crops, maybe slightly more alkaline than some. Um, but corn is a heavy feeder, specifically of nitrogen. So if your soil is at all lacking in nitrogen, you will want to amend prior to planting, and you'll want to side dress with a nitrogen amendment at least once during the growing season, twice if you can manage it, in order to prevent your soil from being completely depleted by the end of the growing season. So the best times to side dress are after the corn has had about 10 leaves on it, um, and then again, when you first see the silks appear. Now, this is one reason why a crop rotation where corn follows some sort of nitrogen-fixing legume is a good idea, and one of the reasons for the three sisters method of planting. You can plant sweet corn, use it as a trellis for a crop of pole beans to climb up, which will feed nitrogen into the soil, and that will help feed the corn. And then while the beans are climbing the corn, you can plant any type of vining squash at the base, traditionally a, a pumpkin or a winter squash of some sort, which will crawl across the soil, shading the corn roots and keeping them cool while also choking out weeds. Three sisters, beans, corn, and pumpkins. Which brings me to the spacing requirements for planting corn. You will find every manner of measurement online and in books and in other resources for how far apart to plant corn. Some say five to six inches apart in rows two to three feet apart. Some say 12 inches apart in rows 30 to 36 inches apart. And my commercial grower's handbook says 8 to 10 inches apart for early varieties, 9 to 12 inches apart for late varieties, with rows 30 to 40 inches apart. So what's a gardener to do? <laughs> You plant based on your growing situation. If you are planting only corn in a fairly large area, then plant the seeds about six to eight inches apart in rows that are wide enough for you to walk through to harvest. If you're planting a three sisters garden, you can plant the corn three or four seeds to a mound and then plant the beans at the base of each corn plant after it's about six inches tall or so and then plant the squashes at the bases of the mounds. Or you can plant the corn in a square block, all spaced eight inches from each other, and then plant a bean at the base of all the outermost corn plants and then plant the squash a foot out from that. Don't overthink it. Just make it fit whatever situation you are working with. Just make sure there's enough room between the plants for them to be able to grow and access adequate nutrients and moisture and enough room for you to be able to work without them being too far apart to be able to pollinate. Now, a word of caution here about pollination when it comes to the timing and spacing of your plantings. If you plan to grow different types of sweet corn or different varieties of corn altogether. When we talk about cross-pollination in the garden, it usually only affects plants within the same family. And the results of that cross-pollination won't show up until the next generation. It's the seeds of the fruit that are affected, not the fruit itself. So if your zucchini and your pumpkins cross-pollinate, 
you won't get a zumpkin unless you plant the seeds from one of those fruit the next season. This year's fruits are fine. But remember, corn is a grass, and the grain that we eat is the seeds of that grass. So any cross-pollination that happens this year in corn does affect this year's harvest. So if you plan to grow a standard sweet corn and a sugar-enhanced one, you'll need to isolate. If you plan to grow both sweet corn and popcorn, you'll need to isolate. And you can either do this by time or by distance. So to understand how to do either of those properly, we need to understand how corn grows. Corn is wind pollinated, which means the pollen is spread almost exclusively by the wind. No bees or other insects need to be involved. Corn plants produce pollen and eggs in separate flowers, but those flowers are on the same plant. The male flowers are the tassels, those tall, wispy shoots at the top of your corn plant that contain the pollen. Beneath those tassels is the female part, which is the ear. The silks that grow out of that ear are the pistils that catch the pollen to fertilize the ear. So when the wind blows, the pollen drops from the tassels down into the silks, which are each attached to a single egg cell. Once those eggs are fertilized, they begin to form as individual kernels. As the ear grows and the kernels fatten up, the silks will pop up out of the top of the husk as the ear gets closer to maturity. So this is why it's important to plant corn in multiple rows fairly close to each other or in blocks. That way, pollen from one corn plant can help pollinate the other and vice versa. If you've ever seen an ear of corn that had kernels that were shrunken or non-existent, it's because those individual silks didn't get pollinated so the kernel couldn't develop. And what this also means is that pollen from one type of corn or one cultivar can very easily pollinate the ear of another type or cultivar if they're planted too closely together. So we prevent this by either planting the types so they aren't in that tassel stage at the same time or planting them far enough away from each other that they can't readily cross-pollinate. Now, the timing part is pretty easy. You can just wait three to four weeks after planting your first batch of corn before you plant the second one. And that ensures that the first one is done pollinating before the second one starts to tassel. Now, if you have the space, you can also segregate your planting areas by a minimum of 100 feet, preferably with some sort of structure blocking the way, say a shed or your house even. If you're planting an heirloom variety that you plan to save seed from, though, the recommendation there is to be a thousand feet away from any other corn variety, unless you're going to hand pollinate and use bags to protect the ear and all that nonsense, which is why I say timing is just the easier way to isolate for home gardeners. But this also means that if you have any neighbors who also garden and plan to grow corn, y'all may need to coordinate with each other. The dominant genes are always going to win. So heirloom or standard varieties are going to beat out the sugar-enhanced ones. Sugar-enhanced traits will overtake super sweet or synergistic ones. And overall, dense and popcorn traits will dominate any sweet corn every single time. So know what you're growing and what's growing around you, especially if you live in a rural area and you have neighbors growing field corn right up against your garden fence. And yes, you can grow corn in containers. Now, this depends on the size of the container, obviously, because you're not going to fit, you know, more than two corn plants in a 12-inch pot. But if you have a raised planter that's like three foot by four foot, you can plant that bed completely to sweet corn, all spaced like eight inches apart from each other. They'll be close enough to pollinate and you'll get more plants per square foot, but far enough between each plant to have enough room to grow. And you'll get about 24 to 30 corn plants in there. And then you'll still have some room along the outer edges to plant about 18 pole beans to grow up them, which also means you can use containers like this to isolate popcorn from sweet corn in separate areas of your yard or on either side of your shed. Don't ever underestimate how much food you can grow in containers. 
Finding your garden tools need a little refresh this spring. Look no further than Truly Garden. With tried and true tools I use in my own garden, like their Hori Hori knife, Truly Garden has a curated selection of high quality tools designed to withstand the beating I put my stuff through in the garden. I've got my eye on one of their newest additions, a sickle style hand weeder. To check out all the options and get 10% off your first purchase, go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com slash truly. T R U L Y and use code just grow at checkout. The link is in the show notes. So after you have your corn planted in whatever configuration you decide, be sure you give them plenty of water each week if you can. Corn is a thirsty plant that grows very quickly. Of course, we don't irrigate here and we rely on the spring rains to trap enough moisture in the ground for our corn, so our yields are generally hit or miss. I am growing corn as a midsummer crop this year in raised beds, so they'll be getting watered, which should change up our yield significantly. Remember that corn is very shallow rooted, so if you're growing in a small area, you can mulch between the rows to keep the moisture in the soil and to keep the weeds at bay. Compost is great for this because corn is such a hungry plant. You don't want to be cultivating much between those rows or between the plants to keep the weeds down because you can injure the roots. So this is why growing something that acts as a ground cover, like squash, works really well with corn. Now, one of the biggest problems you may face with growing sweet corn is pests. There are seed corn beetles, wire worms, root worms, aphids, cutworms, corn borer, corn earworm, fall armyworm, flea beetles, and stink bugs, and I'm sure there are others that I'm not aware of, and they all like to eat corn plants. Management of insect pests in an organic method is not easy. Yes, there are a ton of synthetic pesticides out there that you can spray with, none of which I have ever used and can't really speak to because the reason we grow our own food is so we're not eating that stuff. And I know most of you are in the same camp. If we're looking at organic options, there are oil treatments and foliar treatments of both BT and spinosad that can be used alternatingly. And there are predatory insects like trichogramma wasps that can be released to prey on the corn borer and the armyworm. The first line of defense, though, is to be sure that you are encouraging a garden environment that is attractive to those natural enemies of the insects that plague our corn. Make your garden a habitat for things like lady beetles, insidious flower bugs, um, lace wings, parasitic wasps, all the things that eat aphids and worms and caterpillar eggs. It has to be a thoughtful approach that begins well before you even plant that corn seed. So encourage natural predators as a first line of defense and then use oils and sprays as a secondary. Now, the other pests that you might have to worry about are much bigger than the insects, namely raccoons and deer. We have yet to find a fix for that one. If you have a garden with an enclosed fence high enough to keep the deer out, it's likely the raccoons can just climb right over. If you put a top on the area like a cage, the little buggers will pick the lock. I swear, I honestly don't have a solution for you because I'm still working on one myself. And don't believe any old timers that tell you to turn on a light and play a radio in the garden all night long because trust me when I say they'll just throw a party out there and help themselves to the corn while dancing to the radio all night long. Now, diseases in corn include anthracnose, different types of blight, rust, smut, Stewart's wilt, which can be passed by flea beetles, and virus diseases like mosaic virus. So if you've grown corn and you've experienced any of these, or if you've checked with your local extension before planting and you know that any of these is a problem in your area, there are always disease-resistant varieties out there that have been bred to hold up against this disease pressure. Now, with the Stewart's wilt, really what you need to do is prevent the flea beetles that spread the disease. In my experience, it's definitely been harder to manage the pests in corn than it has been any diseases, but that is my area. Your experience may be different. Now, the hardest part to me when growing corn is knowing exactly when to harvest it so it's at its peak as a sweet corn or at its driest as a popcorn or a dent corn. So for sweet corn, pay attention to the days to maturity on your package. About a month before that date, start keeping an eye out for the silks to start popping out of the top of the husk. 
your corn will generally be at the peak of ripeness about 20 days after the silks appear. The silks will have turned brown and dried up a bit by then. So leave an ear on the stalk and just pull open the husk just a little bit to reveal some kernels and just pierce one with your fingernail. If the juice runs out sort of clear and watery, then it's not quite ready. It should have a milky color and texture. If it's thick, more like a cream, then it's overripe and it's not going to be as sweet. You want to harvest at the milk stage. Once you figure out that it's ready, firmly grab the ear and twist downward, snapping the ear from the stalk. Try not to damage the stalk because you can often get a second smaller ear to develop on the same stalk and you'll get a second harvest out of that. Now, if you're growing dent corn or popcorn, how do you know it's dry enough to harvest? These types are left out to dry thoroughly on the stalks before they're harvested. So this could be weeks longer than our sweet corn. So you want the husks to turn brown. You want them to be bone dry. Cut the ears of the corn from the stalk on a dry day, but before your first anticipated frost in the fall, and then peel back the husks to allow the kernels to finish drying out completely. It's actually perfect to use some of your popcorn or your dent corn as fall decor around your house before using it as food. And people give a lot of money for bundled dried up corn stalks as decorations for their porch. So you'll have some ready-made fall decor from your crop. Now, as far as storing your corn, let's look at sweet corn first. Remember, the heirloom and standard types need to be eaten in just a day or two to preserve that sweetness, and they can lose up to 50% of their flavor in just 24 hours. So use them up right away or can or freeze them immediately. The other types can hold quite well in the refrigerator for about a week without losing much in quality, but it still does taste best when it's eaten right away. So if you want to hold it in the fridge, don't shuck it at all if possible. Leave it in the husk. Then put it into a plastic bag to conserve the moisture and then put it in the coldest part of your fridge that also has the highest humidity. Usually this is your crisper drawer. When you're ready to eat it, then go ahead and peel off the husk and wash off the silks before preparing. Now, if you need to prepare it ahead of time and then put it back in storage for some reason, then just be sure you've got the prepped corn thoroughly protected from outside air that'll dry it out because that hastens the process of those sugars turning to starch. Now, if you want to freeze your sweet corn, shuck it, blanch it, and either freeze it whole on the cob or cut the corn off the cob and freeze it as individual kernels. You can also can it up this way, too, using a pressure canner, though, since it's a low-acid food. And now for your dent corn or your popcorn or any other dried corn, make sure that it is truly dry. You should be able to pop a kernel off of the cob without too much of a problem if it is dry. It will literally pop right off. Um, you want to store it in an airtight container. You can either remove all the kernels from the cob by hand or by getting a sheller if you're going to do a lot of them, because trust me, you'll save your fingers. Um, or you can store it on the cob. Just be sure the container is airtight. Um, that way you don't have any chance of rodents or insects or anything getting into it and enjoying it before you do. Kept airtight, dried corn can remain in storage for years. Now, to use your dried corn, you can grind it into cornmeal just the way that it is. But I will be posting some bonus content around this topic over on the Patreon page this week. So if you are a seed patron or higher, you'll have access to information about how to process your dent corn into corn flour. There's more involved than just grinding up the dried corn into a meal in order to make it workable for things like tortillas. But you also get to unlock some of the nutritional content too. I post bonus content over on Patreon every week. So if you want more information about some of these topics and other things like intercropping and crop rotation, videos on different topics, quarterly discount codes to the merch shop and more, head to patreon.com slash just grow something or you can hit the link in the show description. And if you'd like some of the other ways to show your appreciation for me and this show and all the content, you can go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com slash thanks. That link will also be in the show description. I appreciate your support. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep on cultivating that dream garden and we'll talk again soon. You just finished another episode of the Just Grow Something podcast. 
For more information about today's topic, go to JustGrowSomethingPodcast.com where you can find all the episodes, show notes, articles, courses, newsletter sign up, and more. I'd also love for you to head to Facebook and join our gardening community in the Just Grow Something Gardening Friends Facebook group. Corn, popcorn, floor, uh, uh, blah, 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 popcorn, florn? No. Sweet corn is higher in vitamins like folate, by six, by six, by by six, what? Lead <sighs> to damage the shallow root system when transplanting, transplanting. Boy, I'm having trouble tonight. Plant about 18 pole beans to grow them up. To grow them up? No, to grow up them. Management of insect plants, not plants, insect plants. Wow. <laughs> Until next time, my gardening friends, keep learning and keep growing.